But when you ain't got nothing, then you got to worry about something. In the annals of blues history, few figures loom as large or as influential as Howlin' Wolf. With a voice that could shake the very foundations of a room, he brought the raw emotion of the Mississippi Delta to the vibrant blues scene of Chicago in the 1950s. But before his rise to fame, his journey was marked by hardship and tragedy, shaping the man and the musician he would become. From his commanding stage presence to his groundbreaking musical innovations, Howlin' Wolf left an indelible mark on the music world, forever changing the blues landscape. Early life. Howlin' Wolf, born Chester Arthur Burnett on June 10, 1910, near West Point, Mississippi, had a life as fascinating as his name suggests. His parents, Leon Doc Burnett and Gertrude Jones, each had their own stories. Doc worked the land as a sharecropper, while Gertrude was a hardworking maid and cook. Interestingly, Chester's name was a nod to the 21st President of the United States, Chester A. Arthur, chosen by his parents as a mark of respect and perhaps a touch of aspiration. But his maternal grandfather, John Jones, unknowingly bestowed upon him the moniker that would echo through history, Howlin' Wolf. Young Wolf's life took a turn when his parents split when he was just a year old. His father remained in the Mississippi Delta, while Gertrude took him to Monroe County in the north. Despite the challenges of his upbringing, music found its way into his life early on. Singing alongside his mother in the church choir near Gibson, Mississippi, he credited her for his musical inclination. However, his childhood wasn't without its struggles. Gertrude, battling mental health issues, sent him away at 10 leaving him to wonder why. Perhaps this void fueled the mommy issues that lingered with him throughout his life. After being chased away by his mom, he moved in with his great-uncle, Will Young. Living with his great-uncle, Will Young, posed its own hardships. Denied education, deprived of food, and subjected to harsh punishments, Young Wolf found solace in music. Even at a tender age, he displayed a knack for it, singing while working and experimenting with homemade instruments. A pivotal moment came at 13 when a fit of rage led him to kill one of Young's pigs, resulting in a brutal punishment. Young became angry and chased him on a mule while he whipped him. After this especially terrifying experience, Wolf traveled barefoot 85 miles to the Delta to meet up with his father. It was there, amidst his father's large family, that he finally found a semblance of peace and belonging. Doc Burnett was glad to see his son, and he cared for him well. To carve out a new identity for himself, Wolf embraced the alias John D. This name stuck with him, known by many relatives for the rest of his days. Standing six feet three inches tall and weighing 275 pounds, Wolf earned nicknames like Bigfoot Chester and Bull Cow. Despite his ventures as a burgeoning blues artist, the young Wolf never strayed far from Doc Farm. Each spring, he faithfully returned to help plow the fields, a gesture that held significant meaning for him budding music career. Despite his own lack of formal education, Wolf recognized its value and encouraged his stepsisters to pursue literacy. Remarkably, Wolf's thirst for knowledge remained unquenchable throughout his life. Despite his humble beginnings, he developed a strong belief in self-education, immersing himself in academic subjects and diligently practicing music. His dedication was so profound that he attended high school classes and guitar lessons for years, culminating in an honorary doctorate from Chicago's Columbia College in 1972. Among Wolf's early mentors was the legendary Charlie Patton, hailed as the father of the Delta Blues. Fascinated by local blues musicians, especially Delta's first great blues star, Charlie Patton's skillful music, who resided nearby at the Dockery Plantation, Wolf asked Doc to get him a guitar. A petite man, Patton played the guitar, snapping and bending strings with his fingers, or making them sob and moan with a slide while rocking a juke house until it almost came off its foundation. This sparked Wolf's love for music, setting the course for his future. At 17, Wolf and his father scraped together enough funds on January 15, 1928, to purchase his first guitar, a milestone etched into his memory until his final days. Watching Patton perform nightly outside a nearby juke club, he absorbed the master's repertoire including iconic blues tunes like Banty Rooster Blues and Pony Blues. Under Patton's guidance, Wolf honed his skills, eventually joining him in performances around Ruleville. Later, he took impromptu harmonica lessons from Sonny Boy Williamson II, who was dating his stepsister, Mary. Wolf learned to sing by listening to records by his idols Blind Lemon Jefferson, Tommy Johnson, the Mississippi Sheiks, Jimmy the Singing Brakeman Rogers, Leroy Carr, 
Lonnie Johnson, Tampa Red, and Blind Blake. Inspired by country music icon Jimmy Rogers, Wolf attempted to emulate his distinctive blue yodel, inadvertently discovering his own unique vocal style, the Wolf's Howl, a signature sound that would define his career. In 1933, Wolf added harmonica to his musical arsenal under the guidance of Sonny Boy Williamson II, further enriching his sound. Throughout the 1930s, he traversed the Southern landscape, performing alongside blues legends like Robert Johnson and Sun House, solidifying his reputation as a fixture on the club circuit. Wolf captivated audiences with his guitar and harmonica, cementing his status as a blues virtuoso. Wolf was a strong, attractive man with no problem attracting women, although these relationships occasionally ended badly. In one instance, Wolf tried to protect one female acquaintance from an angry boyfriend, and the two men clashed, with Wolf killing his opponent with a hoe. The details of what followed remain unclear, but it's evident that Wolf's life was as colorful as his music. Military Service In April 1941, Wolf enlisted in the American Army embarking on a journey that would take him across various military bases nationwide. The plantation workers in the Delta had alerted military authorities because he refused to work in the fields, which led him to be inducted into the Army. Wolf's service in the U.S. Army during World War II was an unpleasant experience. Assigned to the 9th Cavalry Regiment, known as the Buffalo Soldiers, Wolf began his service in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, undergoing basic training and performing laborious tasks. His journey continued to Camp Blanding in Stark, Florida, where he was on kitchen patrol duty daily and entertaining fellow soldiers with his guitar at night. Later, Burnett was sent to Fort Gordon in Georgia, where he would perform on the mess hall steps with his guitar. Then, a young James Brown first heard Burnett play, as he came to the fort almost daily to earn money cleaning shoes and doing buck dances for the soldiers. Meanwhile, Wolf's illiteracy posed challenges during his assignment at a tutoring camp in Tacoma, Washington, where he faced ridicule and physical punishment for his shortcomings. The drill teacher would beat him up for spelling and reading mistakes. Burnett soon started experiencing uncontrollable episodes of shivering, lightheadedness, fainting, and mental disorientation. Struggling with health issues and mental disorientation, Wolf's military career was cut short when he was declared unfit for duty in November 1943 leading to an honorable discharge. Returning to West Memphis, Arkansas, Wolf resumed farming with his family, and it was here that Wolf's career in music began in earnest. As Wolf continued striving for a major blues breakthrough, he ran across his mother, Gertrude. She continued to be furious with him because he was playing the devil's music, a common reaction among African Americans. Despite his mother's disapproval of his blues music, Wolf formed a band in 1948 featuring talented musicians like Willie Steele, Junior Parker, Willie Johnson, Matt Guitar Murphy, and a pianist known as Destruction. He had also established himself within the community as a radio personality. His performances on local radio stations like KBUM and occasional appearances with Williamson on KFFA in Helena, Arkansas, garnered him a dedicated following and boosted his popularity. His bands experimented with electric blues and garnered strong local support. When listeners tuned in for Wolf's show, the sound was up to the minute electric, which featured the explosive guitar work of Willie Johnson, whose aggressive style not only perfectly suited Wolf's sound, but also orally extended and amplified the violence and nastiness of it as well. In any discussion of Wolf's early success, both live over the airwaves and on record, the importance of Willie Johnson cannot be overestimated. However, during this time in West Memphis, he first encountered the extraordinary guitar skills of Hubert Sumlin, who would later become a crucial part of his band in Chicago, marking the beginning of a legendary musical partnership. Career Big Break In 1951, Howlin' Wolf's career took a significant turn when Ike Turner, a freelance talent scout, caught wind of his raw talent in West Memphis. Turner facilitated recording sessions for Wolf with the Bahari Brothers at Modern Records and Sam Phillips at Memphis Recording Service. Astounded by Wolf's fervent singing, Phillips remarked on the intensity that filled the room whenever he performed, praising his soulful delivery. This marked the beginning of Wolf's ascent into electric blues. Anytime you thinking evil, you thinking about the blues. A genre that resonated deeply with audiences across both the Deep South 
and the northern urban centers during the period known as the Great Migration. Quickly gaining prominence, Howlin' Wolf joined a band with guitarists Pat Hare and Willie Johnson. Phillips, renowned for his knack for discovering musical talent, later regretted losing Wolf to chess records, recognizing him as his most significant discovery alongside the likes of Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash. As Wolf would proudly relate years later, when chess finally won him over, I had a $4,000 car and $3,900 in my pocket. I am the only one who drove out of the South like a gentleman. That same year, Howlin' Wolf's debut singles were released by two distinct record labels, Chess Records and modern subsidiary RPM Records. By December of that year, he had signed a deal with Leonard Chess, who encouraged him to move to Chicago, a hub of blues music. Muddy Waters was the star of Chess Records when Wolf traveled to Chicago in 1953 to join the label. Waters provided Wolf with a room to stay in the Windy City, but there was a catch. With his band, Wolf stormed ahead, forcing Muddy and his crew out of the Zanzibar Club in no time and starting a well-known rivalry. Undeterred, Howlin' Wolf forged ahead, assembling a new band in Chicago. He recruited local talent such as Jody Williams and persuaded guitarist Hubert Sumlin to relocate from Memphis to join his ensemble. Sumlin's restrained solos and subtle phrasing perfectly complemented Wolf's powerful voice, solidifying their musical partnership. Despite initial challenges, Howlin' Wolf's move to Chicago proved to be instrumental in shaping his career. After settling in Chicago, the Howlin' Wolf Band attracted skilled musicians like saxophonist Eddie Shaw and drummer Sam Lay, with Shaw eventually assuming leadership. As Wolf stepped into chess studios, he encountered a shift in musical dynamics from the aggressive Memphis style to a smoother Chicago backbeat, marking a subtle but significant transition. Hubert Sumlin emerged as Wolf's most enduring musical collaborator, initially joining as a rhythm guitarist in a 1954 session. Over the years, Sumlin's playing evolved, eventually assuming the role of lead guitarist within the band. Life in Wolf's bands was rocky and sometimes violent because Wolf believed in rules and enforced them rigorously, much to the chagrin of some of his players. The band's lineup saw many changes, collaborating with notable guitarists such as Freddie Robinson, Buddy Guy, and Willie Johnson. However, Wolf ensured his musicians were fairly compensated and provided benefits like social security and unemployment insurance, which attracted top talent. Guitarist Hubert Sumlin remained a constant in the band, contributing significantly to the signature Chicago Howlin' Wolf sound. In early 1958, Sumlin's guitar style took a sharp turn, abandoning chords to deliver electrifying solos often intertwined with Wolf's vocals, characterized by frenetic runs up and down the fretboard and piercing single notes. Acting as Wolf's musical counterpart, Sumlin seamlessly assumed this role until the end of Wolf's career. By 1956, despite fierce competition with Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf's singles dominated the Billboard R&B charts in the 1950s, including classics like Smokestack Lightning and How Many More Years. In 1959, the band's debut album, Monin' in the Moonlight, showcased their earlier singles, a common practice of the time. He maintained his status as a top draw in Chicago and on tour, with records selling well, particularly in the southern regions. However, by 1960, Wolf had joined forces with chess staff writer Willie Dixon, resulting in a prolific partnership where Dixon penned most of Wolf's material for the next five years. This partnership, along with Sumlin's unique guitar style and Dixon's skill as a songwriter, helped Wolf enter the next decade with great success. Through their groundbreaking records and memorable performances, Howlin' Wolf's influence transcended his era, leaving an indelible mark on the music landscape for generations to come. Rising fame and influence. In the 1960s, Howlin' Wolf soared in his blues career, captivating audiences with his distinctive style. However, as new musical genres like rock and roll and Motown soul emerged, his popularity among younger African Americans faded. Yet, like many blues artists of his time, Wolf experienced a resurgence in demand after being rediscovered, with hits such as Wang Dang Doodle, Backdoor Man, Spoonful, The Red Rooster, later renamed Little Red Rooster, I Ain't Superstitious, and Going Down Slow, written mostly by Willie Dixon, Wolf cemented his place in music history. Although these songs didn't receive much radio play initially, they later became Chicago blues classics, gaining widespread attention when rock bands worldwide embraced the chess records repertoire. Notably, 
the Rolling Stones' rendition of The Red Rooster soared to number one in England, showcasing Wolf's enduring influence. During the 1950s and 1960s blues revival, Wolf embraced a new audience among white youngsters, becoming one of the first black blues performers to do so. He further solidified his international presence by touring Europe with the American Folk Blues Festival in 1964, earning admiration from bands influenced by his work, including ambitious American blues musicians like Charlie Musselwhite, Michael Bloomfield, and Paul Butterfield. In 1964, Wolf and Dixon parted ways, thrusting Wolf back into the studio to craft his own musical path. The infectious tune Killing Floor emerged among his creations, distinguished by a contemporary rhythm and Sumlin's unforgettable guitar riff. Its irresistible charm led the rock band Led Zeppelin to embrace it for one of their early albums. Let me see my little red rooster, darling, I want you. A trend they'd established with various blues classics. By the decade's end, Jeff Beck, The Doors, The Electric Flag, The Blues Project, and Cream were all lending their talents to recording Wolf's compositions. This wave of covers brought Wolf newfound acclaim from a youthful, predominantly white audience. In response, Chess Records ushered him into the studio for a psychedelic venture, regrettably marking a low point in his career. European audiences were also introduced to Wolf's music thanks to international promoters and the endorsement of the Rolling Stones, who insisted on his appearance on the hit TV show Shindig in 1965 during the peak of the British invasion. Wolf's appearance on Shindig marked his network TV debut and left a lasting impression on millions of viewers. Accompanied by the Rolling Stones, Wolf delivered a powerful performance of How Many More Years, with the Stones paying homage to him from their humble positions. Fondly remembered by Wolf, the Rolling Stones' respect for his talent endured throughout his life. Amidst a shifting blues market, Wolf remained committed to staying connected with his audience back home. Encouraged by chess records, he ventured into new musical territories, embracing electrified blues akin to Muddy Waters' Electric Mud album, soulful melodies, folk influences, and collaborations with blues icons like Bo Diddley and Little Walter. Despite initial hesitation, Wolf continued exploring, seeking a groove that resonated with his fans. However, by 1970, Chess recognized the potential in the London session record trend and dispatched Wolf to the British capital. He collaborated with luminaries such as Eric Clapton there, marking his final major triumph. Despite Wolf's ailing health, this session far outshone the ill-conceived attempts to modernize his sound for a younger demographic in previous years. Teaming up with visionary musicians like Gene Barge and Pete Cozy, he produced two standout albums, the Howlin' Wolf album and the London Howlin' Wolf sessions, featuring luminaries such as Eric Clapton and Steve Winwood. Yet, while the latter album catered to a hippie audience, Wolf found himself at odds with the bold album cover, which he felt misrepresented his sound. This artistic discord and his initial reluctance to embrace the electric guitar may have contributed to the modest sales of the Howlin' Wolf album. However, the London Howlin' Wolf sessions found greater acclaim across the pond than in his native America. It was his best-selling album, reaching number 79 on the pop charts. In 1973, Wolf released his final album, The Backdoor Wolf, a testament to his enduring talent despite declining health. Recorded with his loyal bandmates, including Hubert Sumlin, Detroit Jr., Andrew Blue Blood McMahon, Chico Chisholm, Lafayette Shorty Gilbert, and the band leader Eddie Shaw, the album showcased new material in a concise format, reflecting Wolf's constrained physical condition. Clocking in at just over 35 minutes marked the end of an illustrious career, leaving behind a legacy that continues to inspire generations of musicians. Personal life. Contrary to his on-stage persona, Wolf lived a life devoted to family and community. A quintessential middle-class family man, he owned farms in Arkansas, engaged in activities like hunting and fishing, and volunteered at the local fire department. Although Sonny Boy Williamson too was the primary guitarist in his band, Wolf himself was no stranger to guitars, having played various models during his European tour, including the iconic 1965 Epiphone Casino and the 1966 Gibson Firebird 5 featured in the Down in the Bottom video. Wolf's bond with Sumlin, described as a mix of love and spite akin to a father-son relationship, shaped their music, making it deeply resonant and often indistinguishable. 
Sumlin remained a steadfast collaborator, a rarity in Wolf's career. This intimate connection may have contributed to their musical synergy. Despite his success, Wolf remained frugal, famously driving himself from Memphis to Chicago with $4,000 in his pocket, a significant feat for a black blues musician of his time. He pursued education later in life, obtaining a general educational development and delving into accounting and business courses to manage his affairs, despite struggling with literacy until his 40s. Wolf's personal life was marked by significant relationships, including his marriage to Katie Mae Johnson and later to Lily Handley. While Katie May did not join him in Chicago and succumbed to breast cancer, Lily became his steadfast partner. Their relationship blossomed from a chance encounter at a Chicago bar to a lifelong commitment characterized by deep affection and mutual respect. Their union extended beyond romance as they raised Lily's daughters, Betty and Barbara, together, providing stability for their family. Even after Wolf's passing, their love endured, evident in the accounts of those who knew them intimately. His legacy extended to future generations, including his great-nephew, the West Coast rapper Scheme. Married life brought financial stability, allowing Wolf to provide perks like health insurance for his band members, ensuring they were well taken care of. Despite his newfound wealth, he remained modest, opting for a Pontiac station wagon over flashy cars, a testament to his grounded nature. Failing Health and Death In late 1969, Howlin' Wolf's robust health took a sharp downturn. The journey to a University of Chicago performance with Hubert Sumlin turned dire when Wolf experienced his first heart attack, collapsing onto the car's dashboard. Acting swiftly, Sumlin, also serving as the driver, grabbed a nearby 2x4 from the road and jolted Wolf's heart back to life with a well-aimed thrust. Only three weeks later, while touring in Toronto, Wolf faced further cardiac and kidney complications. Despite medical recommendations for surgery, Wolf's determination to continue performing prevailed, adamantly expressing to his wife his need to persist in his craft. The year 1970 marked a significant blow to Wolf's health after a devastating auto accident left him with severe kidney damage, necessitating dialysis treatments administered every three days by his wife, Lily. Even amid deteriorating health, Wolf forged ahead, recording the London Howlin' Wolf sessions in the UK in May of the same year, though his kidneys faltered, and another heart attack followed shortly after. Despite escalating blood pressure and health concerns, Wolf resumed performing by May 1973, gracing stages across the country, including Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he shared billing with musical icons like Bruce Springsteen, George Thorogood, and Bonnie Raitt. Concerns for his health were so grave that his band leader, Eddie Shaw, limited his performances to six songs per set. Occasionally, some of Wolf's old fire would blaze from some untapped wellspring, and his final live-in studio recordings show that he could still tear the house apart when the spirit moved him. By the close of 1973, Wolf's disillusionment with the music industry deepened feeling exploited by younger white musicians profiting immensely from his labor. In a bold move, his legal team launched lawsuits against Chess Records and Arc Music in May 1974, alleging exploitation. Tragically, Wolf didn't witness the outcome of these legal battles. In November 1975, at the Chicago Amphitheater, Wolf delivered his final performance alongside blues legends B.B. King, Albert King, Luther Allison, and more. Despite his ailing health, Wolf's presence was heroic as he revived his classic songs and even reprised his signature stage antics, like crawling across the stage during Crawling King Snake. It was a poignant moment, immortalizing the enduring spirit of a blues icon. The audience responded with a thunderous five-minute standing ovation. Immediately off stage, Wolf required urgent medical attention and had to be revived a poignant reminder of his artistry's toll on his health. In January 1976, just a few months after wowing audiences at the Chicago Amphitheater, something unexpected happened to the legendary performer Wolf. He had to check into the Edward Hines Jr. Veterans Administration Hospital in Hines, Illinois, for kidney surgery. Sadly, the journey took a tragic turn as doctors discovered a carcinoma in his brain just three days before he passed away. His passing at the age of 65 was attributed to a combination of factors, including a tumor, heart failure, and kidney disease. He found his final resting place in Oak Ridge Cemetery, located just outside Chicago, in a serene plot in Section 18. If you visit his grave, you'll find a touching tribute, an image of a guitar and harmonica etched into his gravestone, a testament to his enduring legacy in music. 
legacy. Howlin' Wolf left an indelible mark on the world of blues music. His influence is so profound that he receives recognition and accolades even after passing. In the 1980s, the Blues Foundation honored him with a posthumous induction into the esteemed Blues Hall of Fame. Fifteen years later, his hometown of West Point, Mississippi, proudly admitted him into the Mississippi Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The recognition didn't stop there. He was also enshrined as an early influence in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Notably, on September 17, 1994, the U.S. Postal Service paid tribute to Howlin' Wolf by releasing a commemorative 29-cent postage stamp featuring his likeness. In 2005, the Howlin' Wolf Blues Museum opened its doors at 5070E Westbrook Street in West Point, providing enthusiasts with a sanctuary to immerse themselves in his legacy. An annual event further celebrates his enduring impact. Betty Kelly took on the mantle of seriously preserving Howlin' Wolf's heritage by founding the Howlin' Wolf Foundation. This nonprofit organization aims to uphold its musical heritage. The foundation's endeavors include supporting blues musicians and programs, conserving the genre, and offering scholarships to aspiring musicians. In contemporary music, the experimental rock group Swans paid homage to Howlin' Wolf with their song Just a Little Boy for Chester Burnett from their 2014 album To Be Kind. This track showcases Michael Jira's emotive vocals, reminiscent of Howlin' Wolf's own style thereby keeping his spirit alive in modern music. In recognition of his towering vocal prowess, Rolling Stone placed Howlin' Wolf 59th on their list of the 200 greatest singers of all time in 2023. His significance lies in his contributions to music and his role as a cultural educator, introducing audiences worldwide to the rich heritage of blues music. Today, Howlin' Wolf is a beacon of American musical greatness inviting all to explore and revel in the blues. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.